Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Ron, and uh, uh, again, thank you to the center and Mr. O'Shaughnessy for putting this event together. Um, they told me that uh, they took a vote and, and they decided that I would be first, but in true uh, elected autocratic uh, fashion, I wasn't present for the vote, and uh, I didn't get to send an observer either. So I mean, you know, I, I guess they uh, did too much reading in preparation for this. Uh, what I'd like to do is to just briefly uh, go over some of the conditions uh, in talking about Venezuela and, and talking specifically about uh, Hugo Chavez, uh, uh, certainly can qualify as a, an elected autocrat. First, I'd like to talk briefly about the conditions precedent in Venezuela before uh, his rise to power, his rise to power and the effect that that had on Venezuela. Uh, how did it come to this in, the, in terms of what he did in power uh, to become autocratic? And finally, what we should be doing now. Uh, certainly the conditions precedent in Venezuela were not unique to Latin America during the times. You had a strong man who was overthrown in 1958 uh, by the name of um, uh, Perez Jimenez. And what, what came out of that was actually not a bad system. You had a two-party system. Uh, one by uh, one party by the name of Copai, the other party AD. Copai was a Christian Democratic Party. AD was a Social Democratic Party. Seemed to work pretty well. They alternated uh, in elections pretty much over the next couple of decades, uh, and uh, things uh, seemed to be pretty good. Uh, oil uh, was nationalized in Venezuela under a company called PDVSA, uh, and the receipts of that oil seemed to be uh, used in a, in a fairly good way. But there were some clouds on the horizon. Uh, in uh, the 60s, there was something called the Caracaso, which was an uprising of poor people in the slums of uh, Caracas. Dozens were killed. And, and quite frankly, nothing happened afterwards to really alleviate the kind of misery that these people were facing. Uh, at that time, 55% of the population was living in poverty, which at the time was described as less than a dollar a day. Uh, and conditions continued to worsen as these two parties divided up the spoils every time they won. In other words, everyone who got a job with government from the, the guy who was the portieri, the guy who was the, the doorman, if you will, of ministries, all the way up to the ministers themselves, were all divided out according to who won the elections. And if you were not political, if you weren't plugged into the party, you got nothing. Uh, this system kept going for a long, long time, longer than it should have. It became very sclerotic. Uh, it did not listen to the needs and the wishes of, of poor people at the time. And quite frankly, uh, what was happening in the world at the time, particularly in Latin America, and by the way, Latin America has had its parallel of the Arab Spring. But one thing you have to remember in Latin America is things move much more slowly and deliberately, okay? And this, uh, this Latin spring started back in the 90s and, and started to accelerate. And uh, one of the things that you need to think about in terms of Chavez, or at least I use, is the fact that uh, he was not, he was very much a part of his times, and he, he led his times in some ways on the cutting edge, okay? But he was very much a part of his time, some, uh, similar to uh, a surfer catching a wave. He happened to be at the right place at the right time with the right street cred, was able to rise to power and then take this, this, this movement, if you will, throughout all of uh, Latin America to, uh, uh, to uh, new heights and quite frankly uh, fashioned it in his own way. Um, one of the things that, uh, that you find in many of these uh, countries that have uh, elected autocrats is their ability to be able to feather their nest and those of followers with uh, the, the proceeds from commodity sales, in this case, gas and oil. Uh, Venezuela is sitting on the largest reserves of petroleum and gas in the world, larger than Saudi, than Saudi Arabia. And you can begin to see what that has done to the politics of the region over the, over the decades. Um, Chavez, the rise of Chavez. Uh, Chavez came from a very poor family in the Llanos, the interior of the country. Uh, he uh, was farmed out to his grandmother at a very young age uh, and lived with her. Uh, the other seven children in the family lived with mom and dad, who were school teachers at the time, but he was kind of shunted off to his grandmother. Uh, his grandmother was very poor, dirt, uh, dirt uh, house, palm frond roof, 
uh, the grandma used to cook candies, make candies and that sort of thing in the kitchen, and he would go out after school and sell them on, on the street, similar to what you see even today in Latin America with all these street urchins selling trinkets and candies and things like that. Uh, there's a lot of parallels between him and President Obama. Not the poverty issue, but a lot of other things uh, that I can go into later. But suffice it to say that, that uh, he... Uh, was a person who, from a very early age, felt a, a very deep sense of justice and inequality. Okay, when he looked around, he saw his his station in life. He saw others, uh, and uh, it began to become readily apparent to him that society wasn't just uh, because he was living the way he was living with his grandmother. He was kind of shunned by his father, uh, uh, and. Um, I think things pretty much took a, a deep turnaround for him when he was accepted into military academy at the age of 17. Uh, he was one of, of many, many leftist cadets at the time. Uh, they would uh, sit after class and talk about the inequities of Venezuelan society, Latin America, the imperialism of the United States, and that sort of thing. So what happened when we see, when we consider Chavez 30 years 35 years later, is something that, that was not new in, in, it was not a phenomenon new in coming. This was something that, that he had been thinking about uh, his, whole, his whole life. Um, at the time that uh, uh, Chavez rose to power, I'm going to skip all the way to 1992. Chavez is a lieutenant colonel stationed in the um, border between uh, Colombia and, uh, and Venezuela. Uh, and he sees firsthand not only the lot of the poor who live out there, but he also sees that the FARC guerrillas, the Colombian guerrillas who are operating on the Venezuelan side of the border and using Venezuela as a safe haven, are seen as the legitimate force in this area by Ven both Venezuelans and emigre Colombians living on the Venezuelan side of the border. Uh, and that they not only exert taxes or war taxes from businesses and that sort of thing and traffic in coca, but they also give some of this back to the, to the poor people who live in their areas of operation. When I had a conversation with Chavez years later, he told me that this was indeed the case and that uh, we, were, we were looking at the FARC from a completely wrong angle and that they were very much a popular force and we should change our policies as a result of it. Uh, 1992 coup, he loses. Uh, many of the uh, f uh, officers that were in the coup with him fled to other countries to include Peru. Uh, he was jailed for two years, and then after two years of spending uh, a great deal of time contemplating, thinking, writing, meeting with leftist universities, uh, professors, and other thinkers in Venezuela, uh, he's released on good behavior by uh, President Caldera and is sent... Uh, uh, well, goes home for a while and then goes to Cuba. In Cuba, he spends about six months. He gets his health back. Uh, he uh, reads. He meets uh, with, uh, with communist officials in Cuba. And Fidel gives him the same message that he has given to Salvador Allende and others, uh, democratically elected leaders, and that is if you go gradually to a socialist revolution, you can, you can get this done. Fidel obviously admitting the fact that he had gone way too, too fast. The means of production fled the country. He was left uh, with an economy in tatters. And while, he, while they never understood what, what capital needs and what capitalists and businessmen need, they did know that going slower would be a better way to do it as opposed to having to try to pick up the pieces after uh, the means of production uh, are, uh, are dis have disintegrated. Uh, in his writings, he... he, he includes a, um, a good dose of Venezuelan nationalism with Bolivar and the egalitarianism of Bolivar. Now, Simón Bolivar, it's interesting that we're here uh, in uh, a, a center dedicated to President Jefferson. Bolivar, in many, many ways, is considered to be not, democrat not a democratic person, okay, not a democratic leader. At the same token, you can read a lot of what Simón Bolivar wrote and interpret it in so many different ways, as you can read Thomas Jefferson and interpret it in so many different ways. Uh, and what he took from Simon Bolivar was the man of the people, 
uh, the, the uh, leader who was looking out for the poor, and he wrapped himself in the mantle of uh, Simon uh, Bolivar, plus the intense nationalism. He wins the elections in 1998, comes back, uh, wins the elections by 56% of the vote, uh, and uh, begins to draft a new constitution right away. Okay, country is in desperate uh, shape. He convinces people that it needs a new constitution. Uh, they draft one, including a great deal of power concentrated on the executive. Um, and then, of course, when all of these drafting committees get done, they don't include the first term of the president who determined that there needed to be a new constitution as counting because now you've got a new constitution, so the clock should start ticking. So he gets an extra five years automatically. Um, essentially what he did, and I remember very clearly, um, one of the things that, uh, that uh, you, um, you see is that um, people think that America pushed Chavez in the direction that he went with. Okay, nothing could be further from the truth. Uh, I was deputy assistant secretary, principal deputy assistant secretary at the time, essentially the number two person in the bureau. Jeff Davidow, who, my, who was my boss at the time, asked me to go to Venezuela because he, yeah, Chavez had just been elected. Jeff had been the ambassador in Venezuela and who had spoken out against coup plotters to include Hugo Chavez. Uh, and they wanted to put a, a new face on the ground down there. Uh, I don't know about a new face, a different face perhaps, but not necessarily a new face. And so they sent me down, and I, my job was to reach out and to try to, uh, try to forge a relationship with this guy. Uh, in the course of the next six months, I made eight trips down there, uh, some with our Attorney General Janet Reno, others with Barry McCaffrey, cabinet-level folks. Uh, and we really reached over uh, about as far as we could to try to... Uh, uh, reached some understanding with, uh, uh, with President Chavez. Uh, I remember his first trip to the United States. He wanted to go to New York and meet with uh, leading uh, American businessmen who had interest in Venezuela. We set him up with the Council of the Americas. Uh, he wanted to meet with President Clinton. He was still a president-elect. He hadn't been sworn in yet, highly irregular. I was able to cut through the clutter of protocol and, and get that done. He and Bill Clinton had a great meeting, and uh, Bill Clinton said to him, uh, Listen, they tell me that you're a populist. I like to think I'm a populist president. Uh, but uh, we can have, we can do good things together, but as long as you adhere to the constitutional rules that govern your, 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 your presidency in Venezuela. And that was the key. Because one of the problems with our policy in Latin America and elsewhere is that we, we do not have a floor for democracy any longer. Okay, uh, when you're elected, we, we concentrated our efforts on, on elections for way too long uh, without going deeper. In Latin America, we attempted to go deeper by setting minimum requirements called the Demo Democratic Charter that happened to be ratified and passed by all countries in the hemisphere except for Cuba on 9-11-01. But you don't hear about it much because other events kind of took over. Uh, and as soon as that was passed, the Venezuelans and, uh, and other allies began to undercut it. So it was never really implemented. So you still have it in the Western Hemisphere and regrettably elsewhere, uh, a system where we stress elections, but then we really don't know what to do with what happens after that. Uh, and when these uh, elected autocrats start consolidating power through all kinds of different ways that we can go into later, um, we just don't know what to do with it. Uh, we're not constitutional lawyers in Venezuela or in uh, Belarus or Russia, and we tend to give them a pass as a result of it. What do we do about it? I think that uh, one of the things that should be done, and let me just stress first of all that the Obama administration's policy in the hemisphere writ large, but also in Venezuela particularly, seems to be let's let this model fail. Let's let it just play out. It's failing already. Uh, uh, President Chavez died two years ago. Uh, his hand-picked successor, President uh, Maduro, came from uh, being a bus driver and then a union leader and then a trusted loyalist, has very few skills outside of uh, what, uh, what uh, President Chavez has taught him. And uh, I think that uh, they're headed for disaster. They have off-term elections, non-presidential elections next month. They're expected to lose. Uh, and uh, inflation is up at 200 percent. 
the economy has contracted by 10 percent or will contract by 10 percent at the end of the year. Poverty is up to levels, uh, uh, pre-Chavez levels again. Uh, the system uh, is uh, as corrupt and inefficient as you can imagine. And oh, by the way, um, uh, Caracas has a higher homicide rate than Baghdad did between 2003 and 2011. So uh, the worst homicide rate uh, in the Western Hemisphere for sure. What should be done? Uh, I don't think we, we should have the luxury, I don't think we have the luxury of being able to wait and see what happens and let this thing play out without us doing something. First thing is that uh, one of the things that Chavez did was to control, pretty much take over control of the media. And if you can imagine uh, sitting in Venezuela, as I have, watching TV and listening to radio and getting, it doesn't, it doesn't really matter what station you're on or what channel you're on, and sitting, uh, sitting there and listening to every single bad thing that has happened in the United States as a narrative of these are who, what the gringos are, these are what the Americans are, this is what they want to do, this is who they are. They've got riots in Ferguson, racial profiling, uh, the disparity between the middle class uh, and, and, and the upper classes is growing uh, larger every single day. They hold themselves out to be a model democracy. Look at all the problems that they've got. They've got Washington in paralysis. And if you can imagine listening to that or seeing that on every single channel, save one or two, all day, every day. It's, it would be like your worst nightmare uh, to see the news so, so, so misconstrued in so, so many ways. In any event, one of the things that needs to be done is to correct the, uh, the record and to begin to direct our efforts towards uh, uh, getting our message out there. No, we're not, we're, we are not perfect, but we have the means by which we can correct ourselves through our own democratic institutions. They do not, okay? Uh, we have the means to be able to hold our elected uh, officials accountable. They do not. Uh, we have the means by which uh, to uh, correct flaws in our economy and in our system through our safety net. Theirs is, 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 is fraying considerably. Um, the other things, that, uh, other things that should be done is to uh, ally ourselves with like-minded countries like Chile, uh, Mexico, Costa Rica, Colombia, Peru, et cetera, and get a democratic message out there to, uh, to Venezuelans. Uh, I think that one of the things that uh, has, has gotten many administrations uh, flummoxed over Venezuela is that uh, they, they, they take anything that you say, turn it around and use it against you so that anything that is said about Venezuela uh, in the end of the day through their control of mass media ends, ends up benefiting the, uh, 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 the regime. I would uh, suggest a, a, a blitz on social media, one that is unrelenting in terms of getting the message out. Uh, and, um, and doing it in such a way as to uh, start to influence the debate in, in Venezuela, which unfortunately is, uh, is headed in the wrong direction. Finally, uh, I think we need to correct the uh, record that we are not there to take Venezuelan's oil away, that, oh, by the way, we are fast becoming uh, one of the largest producers of oil and gas in the world, uh, and this is just propaganda. Uh, I think we need to restrict the visas of uh, Venezuelans to the United States. I think as long as we take disaffected Venezuelans, and uh, if you go to my hometown in uh, South Florida, you can see hundreds of thousands of Venezuelans that have just come to South Florida over the last couple of years. And I think it's not only a brain drain, but it also relieves the pressure on the regime if disaffected people can easily come to the United States. Uh, I think we need to reinvigorate the democratic charter. Uh, there were some very good things in terms of basic requirements for democracy in the hemisphere that have been ignored uh, or uh, at best ignored but at worst uh, uh, really uh, jammed uh, into uh, a closet somewhere and that needs to be, needs to be uh, reinvigorated in the hemisphere. Uh, I think that at the end of the day, if you were to look historically on Latin America and look at Hugo Chavez as a, as a phenomenon, you would see that he took a lot of his, um, his strategies and his plans from a gentleman by the name of Alberto Fujimori, who had preceded him as president in Peru. Uh, Fujimori did kind of the same things, perhaps not as grand as, um, 
uh, as uh, Hugo Chavez, but it did provide a, a measure of, 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 of strategy that went into, uh, uh, went into Hugo Chavez. Hugo Chavez died at the right time. He died in the nick of time, I think you would say, uh, largely because he wasn't able to preside over what will happen to Venezuela over, over the next couple of months. And finally, we need to look at what gave Hugo Chavez the prominence, not just in Venezuela, but throughout all of Satin, uh, South America that he had, and that is the poor, the disenfranchised, the mixed race uh, folks that are throughout Latin America are clamoring for not only a voice, they're looking around and they're seeing that their numbers in many of these countries uh, can determine who becomes president and who doesn't. But in terms of economic <coughs> development, economic opportunities and that sort of thing. I'll close with the fact that I, I wrote a letter to uh, President Chavez uh, when uh, President Obama won the elections here in the United States. And in that letter I said, you know, here's an opportunity to really cooperate with, um, with uh, the United States. Uh, here's a president who comes from um, organizing poor people in poor communities. He's got a lot in common with you. Uh, he, he wants to try to level a playing field, create opportunities, and that sort of thing. I think if you were to reach out, I think you would find a, 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 willing, uh, a willing hand on the other side. Um, uh, I, he never answered my letter, uh, but I do know from uh, a source that, I, that, it, that worked in his office that he kept it on his desk for several months and uh, never chose to respond. Thank you. <laughs>